pleasure to be here. Uh, even though I'm only up the road, it, I feel as though I'm at a major international conference and uh, it's fantastic to actually uh, have the invitation and also to have the opportunity to share some of the work that we've been doing in University College Dublin over the past 10 years to understand the mechanical forces that lead to head injuries. Um, I'll talk very quickly because I've been asked to try and help us save a little bit of time on our schedule. But some of the work that we've been doing has been motivated by, uh, I've got two video clips and we'll probably play some of these video clips. Some of the work has been motivated by what has happened in equestrian sports. If you see here, this jockey uh, just coming over has fallen. Uh, these guys are fantastic. They're trained how to fall. Uh, and I have one more video clip uh, showing a similar type of accident. Head injury, but amazing. They, I, 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 I admire these guys tremendously. They, they, they know how to fall, and uh, they, they return to play very. very uh, they return to uh, racing very, very quickly. But part of the issue for, um, for part of the motivation for us as engineers is: can we understand the types of forces that lead to these types of injuries, and can we understand whether a force is sufficiently large that it will lead to something that is a serious injury or a mild injury? So if one looks at the distributions of the types of, of injuries that people have sustained, uh, you can see that road traffic accidents, falls and assaults are among the major causes of these types of injuries. Some of the work that we've been doing over the past few years looks specifically at equestrian data in Ireland, France and the UK, and we've looked at different types of injuries, say for example, uh, jump racing, that has the highest incidences of injuries per ride. It seems to have be having a life of its own. Uh, jump racing has the highest instances of injuries per ride. Flat racing, however, has the highest rates of injuries per fall. The reason for this is, of course, that the speeds in flat racing as opposed to jump racing are faster. So while you're less likely to fall in a flat race event, if you do fall because the speed is faster, the level of uh, force is going to be greater. Uh, what's What's quite important, however, if you look at all of the injuries in horse racing, 15% of them all involved concussion, and majority of those involved loss of consciousness. So this is quite a serious injury. I have two equations to explain the mechanics. Think back to when you studied science, or those of you who studied um, uh, physics. We have Newton's law. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. The force is what cause is associated with what we refer to as translational or linear motion. If I get a blow to the head and the line of action of the force passes through the center of mass of the head, then my brain undergoes a translation or a linear motion and it reverberates inside the skull. And why we say that the bigger they are, the harder they fall, is that actually the magnitude of this force is proportional to, linearly proportional to the magnitude of the mass. And A is our linear acceleration. So if we think of falling due to gravity, that's one G. However, we can see that as we have, as somebody is hit by a heavier person or a lighter person, the impacting force is going to be linearly proportional to the mass. So we talk about the force in terms of Gs. This is all for translational motion. The other types of injuries, and Michael O'Brien in one of his last slides made the assertion that actually helmets don't protect against rotational injuries. As an engineer, I love such statements because it's a challenge for engineers. Um, what happens in rotation is quite different. We have a moment causes rotational motion and this Greek symbol, theta double dot, is the angular acceleration. So it's the rotational analog of this linear acceleration. So instead of getting a linear impact, if I get, for example, an uppercut or a glancing blow to the head, I get rotational motion of the brain inside my head. And it's that shearing motion that causes different injuries. We can get concussion we can get brain trauma from both linear and angular uh, motions. So for, as engineers, I and my team are very interested in understanding all about this and seeing what we can do to design better protective helmets. So I have no more equations. I'm going to show you some of the types of models that we've used. These are computational models that we use. So we use uh, models of, uh, of um, 
of humans, and there's a population of these ranging from the 95th percentile male, and those two sports, uh, those jockey falls that we've got, I have two video clips that will show the way we use these types of tools. If we can play these clips, we should be able to see what, so these are the kind of kinematic reconstructions that we get for that first accident, and the second one will show you, similarly, we can see the types of injuries. But what's interesting for us is it actually allows us to quantify the magnitudes of the force that are applied to the head of those jockeys. So that's fantastic because we have tools that can understand the accidents. And understanding the tools, we can put numerical values on the magnitudes of those forces. So over the past number of years, I've been collaborating and really looking for real-world data. Doing laboratory experiments are fantastic because they're controlled. You've got absolute control over what you do there. However, a limitation is that they're not always as representative of what happens in real life. So Beaumont Hospital, we had a, a, a question from the floor earlier from somebody in Beaumont Hospital. We've been collaborating over a number of years with people there trying to collate real-world accident data. And the types of data that we get allows us to uh, reconstruct some of these accidents. So we've got, say, 10, for example, cases. Case one, a lady fell backwards from the step. The types of injuries that she would have had would be a contusion and a parenchymal hemorrhage. But by building up a population of accidents, a database of accidents, and Chris talked about in, uh, in the States at the moment, they have got a brain bank. And by actually understanding the mechanics of those, we can quantify the forces that would have led to some of those individual incidences or also that would have, over time, led to uh, the accumulation of injuries. So yes, the neurochemicals that are released within the brain uh, are important because they lead to the trauma at the cellular level, but the mechanical forces or the insults are what lead to the release of those chemicals. So we try to collate these types of clinical data and do our our multi-body dynamics reconstructions, and that allows us then to quantify uh, the, uh, the velocities, both linear and angular velocities, uh, which we use then as inputs to the UCD brain trauma model. So a number of years ago, one of my PhD students developed a computer model of the human head, and it has different levels of uh, accuracy within it, and we use material property data that would exist in the literature, and that has been done by controlled experiments. And we can actually map that model using uh, where we have MRI scans to apply appropriate material property data for gray matter and white matter. And that's quite important when we get down to what's happening at the cellular level. So some images of what we have contained within our brain trauma model, you can see that we have a degree of accuracy. It's an idealization, it's not perfect, but it's actually pretty good. It's among the best that actually is available. Using these types of models and to, re to, re to, to analyze a population of cases that we've looked at, we can come up with injury risk curves. So a 50% probability that a person may actually have, in this case, a subdural hematoma. In this case, we say that when the strain rate exceeds about 115 per second. It might not mean much uh, to a non-engineer, but it's actually useful to have that quantitative data because it allows us then to do predictive work and to design better helmets. <clears throat> so we can use our, our model uh, with manufacturers. Manufacturers are starting to use these types of design tools in designing better helmets so that you can actually understand not only what happens to the material of the helmet when you uh, when you do certain controlled impact tests, but actually by incorporating a computer model of the head with a model of the helmet, you can actually not only see what happens to the material of the helmet, more importantly, you can see what happens to the head in terms of the strains that are set up within the brain tissue. And that's very important because if you make material changes or structural changes to your helmet, it allows you then, by changing, for example, the densities of some foams or maybe having clever combinations of foams that one can actually design better helmets to reduce the levels of strains that are set up within the head. Now, I also have a, uh, some, a series of video clips uh, which come from colleagues at the University of Ottawa. If we could play some of these. Uh, some of these are relatively sh short. 
If we could play the first one, please. Uh, Crosby was... Um, uh, So that's one particular view, another view. The shoulder basically to the head, and eye socket we've heard obviously is very, very serious. So this type of data is very, very valuable to us as engineers because we can use reconstructive tools. I think of an, my next video clip, please, will show us what we do in a laboratory environment to simulate this. So you see the impactor coming in from the left, that represents the shoulder coming to the side of the head and we can, we can set that up. I think I have another video clip. So this type of data will give us the forces that are applied, the X, Y, Z components of the force. Next video clip, please. Wins it clear to the far side the, of the oh, Patrick, this is a slightly longer down, one. Face first, uh, in this case, Pacioretty was blocked uh, into, uh, into the, the, the sideline. Had a different type of impact. Of the ice. Brick, you you hear a little bit of a play, and we do the same type of reconstruction. Where somebody had a very similar situation like this with you. This, this is a uh, this is just a very difficult part of the geometry of a rink here. Yeah, nothing Pacioretty could do in this situation. He uses good speed right off the faceoff to get to this puck to clear the defensive zone, and he's trying to get to the outside to get around Chara. And when he tips that puck forward, Chara just wants to take the body. That's his job in that situation. They're sending Chara to the penalty bench, I believe. Yeah, they gave him a penalty for sure on the play. I thought they were going to call it interference. Let's see if we get a look at uh, how late this hit was. Is the chip down the wall. You cannot finish a check. You got to release him when that puck is chipped by. Chara's got to let him go there. And not only does he ride him into the boards, he puts him into that dangerous spot, and that is a defenseless position for Pacioretty. But remember, those two have a bit of a history. It's a major penalty to Chara. Okay, I think we could probably go to the next clip. There's a couple more slow plays of this, but you get the idea he was impacted against the side of the, uh, the sidewall there. So we did a similar reconstruction in my next video clip uh, where... We've turned, so our instrument drops a head form with the helmet vertically down on top of uh, this foam padding. And this foam padding, this vinyl nitrile, is exactly the same type of stiffness material that would be on the side pitch. So again, we can quantify the forces that are applied through the helmet and into that person's head. So what the data that we get from that allows us to look at the linear and angular accelerations. Linear acceleration, remember, force is equal to mass times acceleration. Angular accelerations, remember we talked about the moment is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So what we get are quantitative data in terms of the, uh, the magnitude. So the linear acceleration hits a certain value and it has a duration, and similarly with the angular acceleration. So I've played all of those. These are for the two separate cases. We then use that same data as input to our computer head model and simulate the, uh, the strains that are set up within the brain. So on the left, we can see uh, that the, the, the strain that is set up, these are contours of strain, the strain that is set up within that brain, the maximum values reaches about 40% strain, which is incredibly high. Uh, and this particular, uh, this particular case, Crosby, he had long-term concussion. He was basically out for, he had symptoms that lasted for about more than a year, and he was away from play for about 18 months. However, for Pacioretty, um, the strains that were set up in his brain tissue were about 24%, also very, very serious, but it was a transient concussion. So he was, he was, he was okay after about a week uh, in terms of the brain, but he had fractured vertebrae, so uh, he, had, he had obviously other issues to contend with. So where do we go from here for us? These are generic models. There are opportunities for us now to actually make patient-specific models. So we can take MRI scans or CT scans, do some digital imaging to these, and actually construct patient-specific models. Here's, a, here's a, a computer model that we've built of one particular skull, 
and we do some uh, simulations to look at the strains or the stresses that would be set up in actual physical experiments. So the models are great, but there are things that we could do to make them even better. The data, the material properties that we have for the brain, there's lots of uh, uh, improvements that we could get to characterize the different mechanical properties between gray and white matter. Uh, we're starting to do some of this work in my lab. We're also looking at the mechanical properties of cranial bone, and we're also looking at uh, the mechanical response under impact of skin. So by having m better data in such models, we get better accuracy in, in using them. So I've, my last slide tells us that, uh, in terms of summary, we can actually prevent some fatalities. I don't think it's always going to be possible to prevent all fatalities, but we can also prevent uh, the seriousness of the injuries. How do we do this? Well, the way to do it, in my, in my opinion, is we can design better equipment. Chris talked about his 10-point plan. Equipment is at the heart of one of those points. So for us as engineers, understanding the interplay between the, the linear impacts and the rotational impacts allows us to design better materials in the helmets that can absorb sufficient quantities of those linear energy and angular energy so that the levels of strain that are set up within the brain are lower than they would otherwise be. Future challenges for us as engineers, well, I genuinely believe that if we have more well-documented cases, they are a living laboratory. We need to be able to access some of the data associated with that so that we can actually get more useful data that we can then inform how do we design better protective helmets. Simulation tools do exist. Uh, there's, uh, at the moment, we have been using generic models, so we've got one model, but actually now the tools are beginning to be uh, feasible for patient-specific or customized models. And my last point is that the more accuracy that we want and that when we want to go down from the uh, macro level down to the cellular level, we need better material data of the neural tissue so that we can feed into our computer models. I'll stop there, and if there's any questions, I'll try and answer them. Well, uh, we are fortunate that Dr. Adrian McGoldrick, the Chief Medical Officer of the Turf Club, is here now. I don't know whether he wants to give a personal opinion or a professional opinion, but maybe, Adrian, you'd like to make a comment. Uh, okay, so I think generically what you're asking is, uh, can, we, can we detect whether there's been sufficient damage to the helmet to tell whether it should be replaced? We can... Uh, it doesn't happen that jockeys always do replace them. Mm, thank you. Suppose we have more time for questions at the moment, but if there are any specific questions, you'll be available on site. I'd be very happy to talk to people later.